know my story, right? Rise the fame from the pain to glory, right? Awesome, man. So, hey, everybody. My name is Aaron Gore. I'm the director of partnerships and community for Arrived. Awesome, Aaron. Well, hey, I, full context to everybody. This is not you and I meeting for the first time. This is, this is one of those unique scenarios. So you and I have known each other in a, in a million different ways in the industry, never gotten to collaborate before. So this is the most extensive conversation we've gotten. So this is me learning at the same time. As much as we've been in the same business, I'm learning a lot about your history. So, Aaron, let's go all the way back. And I like to, because you, you've been in this a long time, just like me. So go all the way back to the beginning of your foray into the alcohol industry. What year or what year and what age were you? Yeah. So I kind of came by this industry through kind of an unconventional fashion. So I come from a family where nobody drinks it. And I mean like nobody in the extended family as well. Uh, a couple of them started to branch out. My dad goes, goes through maybe like a bottle of wine a month now. Uh, you know, he's getting real crazy with it. But <laughs> while I was growing up, yeah, yeah, this was like absolutely verboten. There was no no opportunity to even know about it. Like I was convinced the moment like one beer hit my lips, uh, just Satan himself would reach up and pull me down through the floor. Uh, but, you know, that was one of those things. I just didn't have a whole lot of exposure to it and didn't really understand it. So I did what uh, preacher's kids have a tendency to do as soon as we uh, enter the real world and went way too freaking hard on all of it. So, yeah, started drinking craft beer, mostly just because I was starting to discover my tastes and, and really started to figure out what I liked, uh, what I liked drinking on my own time. Uh, and at the time I was doing IT, I was actually doing enterprise change and release management for TJX companies. They own Marshalls, Home Goods, TJ Maxx, and got laid off. Uh, you know, I was a contract worker. I'd been there for a few years, but or a couple of years, and you know, they just didn't need the position anymore. And found myself kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I realized that I hated working in offices, never wanted to go back to a cubicle, and I was good at sales. I was doing a couple of those jobs just on the side to try and make ends meet while I was figuring out my next steps and had a bit of an aptitude for it. So I talked to my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, and you know, she was helping me work through all this and said, well, what do you, what do you like? And I said, I don't know. I like beer. She said, well, do that, which my mind exploded. I just never even thought about the fact that beer was an option, that that was an actual career you could do. I just figured out you could drink it and not, uh, not be damned for eternity. So, you know, I'm, I'm coming along in baby steps. So looked uh, for jobs. I uh, actually got my first job online on Craigslist, which is dating myself a bit here, uh, working for a brewery out of Chicago. I was running the Northeast for them. Uh, first got started running just Rhode Island, and then it was Rhode Island and Boston, then Rhode Island and Mass, and just kept kind of going from there, uh, starting off just a brand rep, running routes, uh, selling into accounts, working with wholesalers, all the normal stuff that the average brand ambassador does. And it's just kind of continued to build, continue to go from there. And I'm, I'm about almost 13 years now. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, so we get on here a lot of times the founders of big companies and things like that. But I want to talk a little bit about you working for big companies, but I want to talk a little bit about for people to understand what it's like, um, maybe a sales rep today that w doesn't work in the alcohol industry. And I want to I want to talk about a lot of people that, you know, when people talk about sales today, a lot of it is inbound leads and pipelines and cold calling and all these things. And it's all technologically advanced. and A lot of it's remote. I want to talk a little bit about because I tell this story a lot, but it's great to have somebody of a, a fellow death of a salesman, Willie Loman kinship. What what's it like in the beginning when you're running in the Northeast as a, and tell, let's talk a little bit about how it literally is walking door to door, pulling doors and, and shaking hands and kissing babies. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. If you've ever seen like in like a classic movie or old sitcom, like the traveling salesman who's like selling vacuum cleaners or, you know, the newest, hottest iron for clothes. Yeah. What, what, what have you, you know? It's exactly like that, except instead of rolling up on uh, classic 1950s housewives and Stepford Wives type neighborhoods, we're rolling up on alcohol establishments, but doing literally the exact same thing. And we might be less welcome. Uh, so getting started in that is, is tough. Like when I hear people say sales, you're right. Like a lot of people associate sales with large organizations because having a dedicated salesperson or sales organization is not common for small companies of any sort. And a lot of people kind of forget that craft breweries, you know, any sort of craft beverage company, you see their stuff on shelves in like a grocery store. You get this impression that they're a whole lot bigger than they are, but a lot of them really aren't that much bigger, have that much more revenue than any given restaurant or bar or dry cleaner. I mean, so they're really working off of not much. So having things like a CRM, like, you know, for customer resource management to be able to track your routes, do all that planning, like that's not 
not even common, especially back then where we were all still figuring out how to do this industry, how this was even going to function in practice. Because you got to remember craft beer, as we think of it today, in the in the sense that the industry has existed today, has only really been around since 2004. It goes back a lot further than that, but uh, in the sense that we think of it today, only th- for, since around 2004. So when you first get started, there's not really a playbook. And I didn't have any resources. They, I didn't get an account list, except I was getting a uh, quarterly account list from my wholesalers. And they, it was just a, a spreadsheet. Literally just saying, here's the, the the address, here's the place. And other than that, I was literally going on MapQuest because this is going back that far and just looking up where these places were at. And other than that, I was literally pounding pavement, walking until I saw a place that had a sign that said beer. And then you walk in, you talk to the host or the hostess, you try to find out who the beer buyer is, if they're going to be on site, if not, when they're available, try to get in front of them get told that you're taking up too much of their time, try to schedule something, get told to die, uh, finally get something scheduled, get your samples, get back in there, get them drunk for free, and then they never buy anything. So Wait, you missed, the, you missed the part where the other three times you dropped off samples, they never made it to the buyer because the bartender... Don't drop off samples. <laughs> never drop off samples. If you ever decide to get into the beer industry selling beer for a living, don't drop off samples because you know who's going to get those? The regulars, their favorite bartender who they had to schedule on a double and they really feel kind of bad about it, so they're trying to make it better it's it's the bar equivalent of a pizza party so never (laughs) drop off samples actually sit there and sample it with them otherwise it's not ever going to them it's going to literally anybody else at best it goes to the back of their fridge for next time they're having a a house party so yeah i'm still i'm I'm still digging for so when i started out i started i'm glad you said 2004 because i started in 2000 2004 is when i started and when i was working for uh, riglio beverage in philadelphia I was going out in downtown Philadelphia and in the University City and Maniunk and all the areas and art museum. And I'm I'm 20, I'm 21 years old or what I can't remember now. Not even 21. Actually, I'm selling this stuff before I was 21. I wasn't allowed to drink it, but I was allowed to sell it. And so I would float around and I would just cover people on maternity leave. They had 57 sales reps across the Philadelphia region. And it was always work for me. Like I was never mm-hmm. allowed to be full time on staff because I wasn't 21, but I could always do those under the radar hotshot sales routes because everybody's like, Nate's good. You just hand him a, a, a couple pieces of paper and he can go sell anything. So I would like show up on Monday and I'd be like, all right, I'm ready to go. I'm 19 years old, 20 years old. And they're like, here's the clipboard. And they have 15 stops for the day. No direction, no priorities or anything like that. Just like, here's our catalog. And the catalog, again, anybody that's selling now, you're lucky. The catalog was a printed catalog that was stapled together. Ours was about 100 pages because we had the hundreds of brands. And then it was like, okay. And then you had to drive in and you're like, how do you prioritize what to see? You had no clue what you're doing. <laughs> oh, and, and it blows my mind. Like you, you see today and even some of the smaller breweries, there's resources now. There's like brewery yeah. management software. You got things like Lilypad, like uh, Red Brewery Management, like Ecos. Like these things can help you yep. at least facilitate your sales, facilitate invoicing. But, you know, to your point, like back in the day, like anytime you see a wholesaler rep these days who's holding a tablet, check your privilege. Dude, I had uh, a, Some I of us had to do it now. I have a photo and I'm, I'm uh, for anybody watching it's I'm probably doing two inches right now, maybe three of a folder that we had that it was all the sell sheets. And we would walk in and we'd have everything like file tabbed out by the by the supplier. And then I have to like fold the thing. It was like um, it felt like in Hocus Pocus when they're pulling out the like the red, the big, uh, the big, uh, you know, batches in front of the cauldron. And then you're like scrolling through this minor little file to find their price point. And then it was just incredible. And then you had to do the math, too, because it was like, well, they're buying 10 cases. So it's a mix and match. So they get a discount. And then you're just throwing a whole another kink into it. So what I was trying to lead into actually was when I went out then, dude, my lead dogs. And I'm, I'm also going to say this because, uh, you know, you know him as well. Sam Calagione was one of the top craft brands I had at that time. I also had Sly Fox. And they were a great brand to have in the portfolio. And then in, the, in Philadelphia, Leff and Hogarden and Stella were still really driving the understanding of appreciation for beer so we were going all around the city doing the stella bartender contests where we were doing the perfect pours and then we had guinness so we were doing so much education when we started for me it was like the perfect time to jump in because the lion's den was already roaring like we were doing education we were doing tastings and it was new to everybody so but at the same time that was the hard part because it was new to everybody it's one of the things I try to get across to people is just how much it's changed. Like back in the day, you're hundred percent right. Like we were having to educate people on why they should be drinking craft beer in the first place. In some cases, educating on what 
beer was. Yep. Uh, these days, it's a lot more about educating people on why they should pick your beer. And that's a very different challenge. It requires a very different approach. It, you know, When you're educating people on an entire category, it's both a unique challenge and a unique opportunity. You can be first mover. You can definitely be first scaler. You're, you have the opportunity to really dictate the terms of the, their relationship with this beverage. Now it's a lot more competitive where now you have to say, hey, here's why my beer is different, why my beer is the one you should be pulling off the shelf from a whole entire set of relatively undifferentiated products. So it's a very different challenge. I wouldn't say it's necessarily harder or easier. There's definitely more tools out there now, but also a lot more competition. But it is back in the day, people didn't know what to make of this. I was selling uh, craft beer in cans back when it was basically us and Dale's. Like, and that, was, that, was that was the other one. That it. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the other one. I remember uh, we had sold Dogfish for a little while, so Sam would come with the truck and everything like that. And he's coming on an episode in November, so that, use this as nice. a little precursor. But um, but yeah, so he would come with the pickup truck and deliver the dogfish. And then I remember in the board meeting, and I'll tell the story there. Uh, Dale Dale and them came in for their first pitch, and it was in front of all sixty of us in a boardroom, and everybody was in suits because that's what you do at a wholesale. You wear suits. And Dale and oh, I can't remember who the other person was that came with them. They were like, hey, we don't really like to do this. So they came in with cargo shorts and construction boots. And it was the first time anyone had walked into that building, not in like a suit or anything like that. And I don't mean this to discredit <laughs> that one specific company. This was an industry-wide yep. uh, standard at wholesalers. You wore a suit and you if you, you probably wore a tie too, depending I was on what I say, now they've uh, gone all the way down to polos. They're really loosening yeah. up. Yeah, so that's I, I yeah I I, I want to tell people there wasn't just this one place that was standard. So Dale and them completely counterculturally walk in with cargo shorts, construction boots, t-shirts, had been had had just been looked like they had just like gotten out of a camping trip, and it was incredible. So then they were like, well, we don't really want to pitch. We're just going to show you guys a video of everybody at the company. And I just sat back and I was like, this is the coolest fucking thing that's about to happen. And they didn't even hit play yet because everybody comes in. It's a PowerPoint and it's all this data that nobody really cares about. And they just come in and they show this video and they just pan around and it's a single take. And they just do like waving of different people that worked at Dale's Pale Ale. And then literally at the end, it was the funniest thing ever. The, all the owners of the company are there. Everybody's there. All the brass. And then at the end, they pull this closet door open and it's one of the other guys. And he's like blowing a huge smoke ring out of the closet and it was just incredible because nobody i laughed out loud hysterically but i'm 21 years old at the time and it was funny as hell but nobody knew whether to laugh or anything and i just i that was the moment i tell a lot of people there's a lot of moments i can tell you from a tasting time when i wanted to be in the craft beer business for the rest of my life but there's moments from a culture standpoint when and it's not because of weed like i'm not saying that i'm saying it was the i don't give a fuck what you think about me i have a quality product and you're going to sell it my way and represent it my way, despite the fact of how you operate. And it wasn't it wasn't aggressive or anything like that. It was just this it was a moment of integrity that you could feel in the room. It was punk rock, man. Like, yeah. like That's the best comparison I can give. It was an intentional subversion of norms. It was, you know, intentionally going a different way than everything that had been set up all the way since back in Prohibition. You know, this was a very button up industry. It was business first. It was very focused on efficiency, very focused on uh, product commodities uh, more than, uh, you know, product passion. And that changed and it changed because of people who knew what they were doing, like Dale, Sam, you know, uh, none of these guys were unaware of the fact that they were going to piss some people off by doing it. They did it for the exact opposite reason. They knew that you needed to push those norms. You needed to push those bounds because that was the only way that anyone was going to pay attention to you. Because if you had to sell this product, this more expensive, gloriously inefficient and in, uh, 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 hard to make, uh, hard to sell, unknown product, and you weren't doing anything to get people's attention, it was never going to work. Like Pete Slosberg out in uh, San Francisco, founder of Pete's Wicked Ale, uh, they were the number two craft brewery in the country until they sold to Shiner uh, in the late 90s. Pete had a, uh, a whole uh, uh, magazine ad where he's just naked in a bathtub filled with Pete's Wicked. Like that stuff would never have happened with any other brand. Certainly not with a guy like Pete, you know, it'd be happening with like the Swedish, uh, uh, you know, uh, swimsuit team or whatever. So uh, really just pushing those bounds and pushing back on it and saying, hey, we can't talk about changing and subverting what beer has become if we don't talk about changing and subverting the underlying culture of beer and more importantly, establishing a culture of beer because it's easy to forget in 2024 that for a very long time, there wasn't a culture of beer. Beer was something people drank. 
there's a culture of whiskey. There's very much and still is a culture of wine. Uh, there wasn't a culture of beer. That was something that was built whole cloth by American craft breweries, at least in the U.S. You know, you have places like England, places like Germany that very much do. And so uh, we owe a lot to them being willing to take that risk of walking in with cargo shorts and, you know, uh, boots because that wasn't a given. None yep. of this was a given and as inevitable as it seems now and as much as we also owe to the fact that there were some cultural shifts towards less but better that were also happening around the same time. None of this happens without people like that being able to, you know, really forge the way for us and give us their shoulders to stand on and do everything else from there. I think uh, what you what you said too is something that uh, I try to I try to make clear in a lot of these episodes because one thing I tell a lot of my episodes is about my sobriety, my personal journey and sobriety from alcohol. Now I I don't that's just from alcohol from my personal thing. And I, I want to really clarify a lot of times we get in conversations like this. I'm actually the opposite of majority of the people in the sober world. I'm actually not an advocate of the destruction of craft beer and the beer industry and the, and the rise of N.A. I really am a, of the abundance mindset. And some might say it's because I've spent 20 years in the industry, but others might say, you know, it's, it looks at it differently because I don't consume it anymore because of uh, health reasons for myself. I got I got addicted to it. And it's one of those things where it's that was a that was a thing that that is not a blame of them. It's me personally. And that's where I feel the responsibility that I want to have conversations like with this, too, because I believe that the industry is in jeopardy of certain ways that people perceive it. And I and I and I I really get upset when I see the non-abundance mindset of of non-alcoholic breweries and and, and those advocates being like do this or not. Like, don't ever go out and drink beer again. Only drink this product. And I don't want to, like, get into a political divisive conversation as much as I want to get it into the um, craft beer came in with the abundance mindset. So when craft beer came in in 2004, it wasn't to eliminate Miller and Coors and everything like that. There was a behind the behind the wall understanding that they needed to exist as well. And they had to continue to drive the industry. And the point of what I'm trying to say is, everything can exist it's just going to change in different ways is what i'm getting at and that includes thc beverages that don't have alcohol eventually ones that do et cetera, et cetera. i completely agree I, for, for one i i'm very glad that we are seeing higher quality in a beverages mm-hmm. i think that's a wonderful thing i'm, I'm a uh, aficionado so uh, that is the certification program for non-alcoholic beverages i'm beer certified through them uh one by uh run by megan anderson is absolutely fantastic yep. but uh, you know, it's wonderful that we have higher quality of those products. You know, when my wife was pregnant, she enjoyed the hell out of uh, drinking some athletic. That was an amazing thing. Things like Seedlip were fantastic to let her continue a lifestyle that was familiar while not necessarily having to compromise the health of, of our future kids. Um, that was spectacular. But even for the business of non-alcoholic beverages, the right approach is moderation and complementation because there are always going to be people who do need to pull back entirely. And that's a wonderful thing. And I think we should destigmatize that and provide as many support and resources as we can. But the vast majority, something like 80 percent of uh, drinkers of non-alcoholic beer are beer drinkers. They are replacing occasions. They are using it to practice more moderation. And it's the same pattern in Europe. And I think we underestimate how many people actually like the flavor of beer if it were not an alcohol delivery mechanism. I would drink it even if it was 0% alcohol all the time. I just like the flavor of it. Most people don't. And so non-alcoholic beer for them is a way for them to still feel like they're drinking beer, to still be drinking beer, and sub out one or two of the beers that they'd otherwise be having in the night so that they can keep drinking beer and enjoying that occasion. That's not a bad thing. That's a wonderful thing. That gets us away from people necessarily stumbling into some of these problems uh, so that they can help self-moderate while still being able to enjoy. Because there is an enormous amount of cultural pressure in the larger culture, but also specifically within craft beer. I know people who have fallen into alcoholism within this industry because they're worried they're going to lose their friends. And so I get that fear. That we need to get rid of. That needs to stop. But non-alcoholic beverages are getting us closer to that. And the more we preach it as an all or nothing approach, the more that a lot of the people who 
love that culture, are in that industry, love having the occasional beer, are going to do the exact opposite and just not drink NA at all. And for me, that's going to do much, much more harm than preaching to take it at whatever pace you're comfortable, but know that this is an alternative so you don't accidentally have five beers in an hour. You can have two beers in an hour and then have three NAs because you just happen to be thirsty because yep. I'm always thirsty. I'm going to be <laughs> drinking whatever's in front of me one way or the other. I'd rather some of them be uh, 0% alcohol so I can keep going to uh, till 3 a.m. and getting myself in real trouble. And the other the other side to this that that from the from the perspective of coming up on two years of being of being like in the in my sober my real sober journey, not the other times I ch- attempted to. But this this one, it really has allowed me to extend my time of being sober because I like you said, it's also from the sober part. And we're a very small piece. We're not we're not con- con- that's the thing a lot of people need to understand. Like the con- the sober world is not gonna like them not drinking and quitting is going to end the craft beer world. Like that's, (laughs) and that's the thing that nobody, everybody needs to understand at the, at the same time from a really uh, hyper local level, having any products alongside of of brands. And I talk to breweries all the time. uh, A lot of breweries. I'm in there all the time doing different sales things and different conversations with the podcast and other things. And a lot of them are are nervous to bring any beers. Not a lot. Let me, let me rephrase that. Anecdotally, I hear others that are afraid to bring any products in because it'll, it'll replace their sales and their brand. And one thing that I want to give a little lens twist to some people on is there's a lot of, there's not a lot, but there's from a localized level, there are people that don't come out because it's not comfortable when you're not drinking. And that's, I'm one of them. I'm, a, I'm an extrovert 20 years in the industry, but until if the place doesn't have an alcoholic product, I feel on, un- I do feel uncomfortable. And that's me. Nobody should change the industry for me, but there's probably more of me. And I'm going to give a story real quick, a 90 second story. I went to, um, uh, uh, Barbados, uh, sandals, uh, all inclusive resort in Barbados. Uh, right when I started the first 30 days, I went sober. I had already purchased everything before I decided to go sober and everything like that. So we had to go on the trip. And when I got there, I had asked for NA, NA, uh, Heineken. I figured, well, that's probably there. You know what I mean? That's, I'm not going to ask for anything crazy. Like they say, what do you want in your room? Blah, blah, blah. Nobody had ever asked for that before. Nobody ever spoken up before because nobody knew that was an option. So then without being anything at all, they're like, oh, that's really cool. You still drink and go out and have fun. And you're still all the all the staff started seeing me out social and all this other stuff. And they're like, what the hell? Like, this is awesome. I'm like, yeah, do you guys want to if you guys put them in the other bars, I bet you there's other people watch the next day. They put a 12, a case in every or actually a case in each bar. There was four different tiki bars across the area by 4 p.m. I went around and looked around. I saw 29 people drinking Heineken at a. Actually muted myself there for a second. I was gonna say, gonna say, man, yeah, I hope, hope you're pulling some uh, some residuals on that. But I, I, I know, it, myself. I was like, I was thinking, I was like, how many resorts, how many places exist where just put it there? Because at well, the end of the day, let's be honest, the margin's still there. That's what everybody else needs to understand. The, the bullshit story, the margins there. The margins are almost equivalent. <laughs> well, and, and honestly, too, I, I try to explain to people. So I, I do a lot of public speaking, uh, a lot of speaking engagements at different brewers, uh, conferences, uh, just a whole lot of educational seminars on a variety of uh, business-oriented topics. And uh, I also work extensively, not just in beer, but also in cider and mead and distilled spirits, a little bit in wine. And um, I, I have a talk that I give on all these non-beer products for brewery tap rooms. With that exact same objection, you know, if we start adding all these, are, are we going to be compromising, A, our identity, and B, are we going to be compromising our sales of our own products that we're making a larger margin on? And, and, and the argument against that is twofold. First, you don't have a differentiator anymore if all you do is make beer because – we like if the whole goal of this industry was to make it easier to get delicious beer uh, like my local dive bar has four craft beer options guys we did it we won like that part we did already so if all you have is hey we make beer they can get your beer down the street they can get your beer probably 15 accounts down the street if you're doing your job so that's not your differentiator you have to be a good hospitality business beyond that and part of that means having things other than just beer the uh the other flip side is Back in the day, people and, I'm, and this wasn't that long ago. You know, 15 plus years ago, people were categorical drinkers. They beer drinkers drank beer, wine drinkers drank wine, spirits drinkers drank spirits, and there wasn't a huge amount of crossover. There really wasn't. Wine and beer drinkers would sometimes trade up to to spirits, but that was about it. These days, that's not how it works anymore. 
almost everybody is Bart, Bart coined the term and it's a pre-existing word, but I love that he introduces to folks is omnibibulous. It means that you drink across categories and almost all drinkers now are omnibibulous to a degree. Uh, the recent Harris poll showed that the average craft beer drinker doesn't even drink more craft beer than any other beverage. They drink more spirits than they drink anything. So everybody is drinking across categories. They drink by use occasion now. They feel in different moods based on what's happening in their day, what's happening in the year, what day of the week it is. Uh, the same person who's buying your Amber Ale one day could be buying your Imperial Stout another, who could be buying a Pinot Noir another day, who could be buying a Mimosa another day, who could be buying a Cider another day. So by having these other products, it's not cannibalizing your up your existing sales. It's incremental to them because those people just aren't going to show up at your place if they're feeling like a cab sob that day or wine in general, and all you have is beer. Because today, for them, for whatever reason they're defining, it's a wine day. It's a wine occasion. So they're going to find a place that has wine. They're not going to compromise and have an IPA. You have to have these other products if you want to be competitive because every dollar that they're bringing in, or at least the vast majority of those dollars, are going to be purely incremental to your own business. And this bears out in the data. bears out in our taproom data. We have the largest uh, repository, our uh, largest data set of uh, brewery taproom data in the entire world. And it bears out for us. We see pure increases in, inc in total revenue when places introduce spirits, when places pick up wine. Uh, it happens anecdotally. It happens uh, across the industry. When people it's start introducing these other beverages, it helps. That's, a, that's really interesting, and it's a good point, and, and led me into where I was going, actually, uh, to le eventually to that, was um, – was looking at, you know, breweries realizing when, as the industry is changing and that foot traffic is more important than ever. And let's uh, specifically, I want to talk a little bit about when the industry does begin to implode. And industry, I want to see, speak about alcohol as a whole. Right now, um, I'm sitting in Pennsylvania and do this road podcast. So right now I'm in Pennsylvania. On September 16th in Pennsylvania, there's going to be 10,000 retailers across the state that are going to be able to apply for a canned cocktail RTD license. The industry is going to go from the spirits are going to go from having to go through wine and spirits and the state store system and all this stuff to now being introduced to the beer retailers and then through that distribution. And also what people don't realize is and anybody that wants to have a turnkey operation, this is my sales pitch that I can help you out with this. Any in-state breweries and distilleries, excuse me, in Pennsylvania that aren't already realizing that the state store distribution system is not ready and anybody that's in-state and can self-distribute, which is every in-state distillery in Pennsylvania, should be looking at the opportunity that they have for the next 12 to 24 months to capitalize on those shelves. On the flip side, craft breweries, those shelves are not going to be added on. They're going to be taking the lowest skews and the lowest, and they're going to be deleting and subtracting and substituting. Those breweries in Pennsylvania are going to be needing the rely on there and other areas. And this, state, this scenario is going to replicate across other states. Yeah. Those breweries need more foot traffic because their wholesale opportunities are going to diminish. They need to be looking at N.A. beer. They need to be looking at N.A. cocktails. They need to be looking at other opportunities. Also, like Pennsylvania, for example, breweries are an anomaly in Pennsylvania. They can, they're the one of the only PLCB licensed establishments that can carry hemp-derived THC beverages. So, Pennsylvania breweries. Also, I have brands for you if you need. But, you know, this is another opportunity to expand out and drive unique opportunities on your shelf because you cannot rely on wholesale. And we can insert any other state to any other scenario, but these shifts are about to happen. And I want to go back to a little bit of you and I is talking about the heydays and the golden days. But at the same time, we I want to compliment. I know you feel the same way with me. Today, you can't do what we did then today because of the amount of brands that are out there. So you know, technology like what you have it arrived and other people like you and other things that help with the sales and the things and the customer relationship management and be able to do that analysis on the fly and be able to have conversations with people from an educated data standpoint. I think that I want to kind of drill back into reiterating that, yeah, we did things analog, but actually that's what makes it so much better to be in the tech side because we can look at everything from an analog lens and see what was done inefficiently and then find a way to make it faster and more efficient. Yeah, I, I, I think nostalgia is highly overrated as a concept in general. Um, and yeah, th they were the glory days. They were beautiful. They were wonderful. They were perfect. If you went back and talked to me at the time, I would have said they're impossible. They're hard. I'm exhausted. I'm stressed. No one knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Why do, don't people understand what a 16-ounce can is? No one else was doing them at the time. That, that you know, it, 
we always tend to remain. Wait, 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 no, no, no. Remember, let's say that. Yeah, I love when you said the 16 ounce can because that conversation where the only thing that existed in a 16 ounce can was like Pap Screw Ribbon and sub premium brands. And we had to go out and I'm just, yeah, I'm sorry. You just struck a nerve on that one. And then go oh, out and no. be like, hey, I understand 16 ounce cans means a dollar a can, but that's not, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I'm asking you to pay uh, uh, $2 a can at the time, which seemed like a monumental sum. Uh, no, it, it is. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> we are in such a – it's a harder market in some ways. It's a, it's an easier market than others. And I will say the tool kits, the tool sets that are out there are better than they've ever been. And that's a wonderful thing. That, like As this industry has matured, industries have grown up to surround it and to support it. You know, We have a an actual critical oversupply of hops now. You know, We have craft maltsters that are out there uh, just to support the malting needs of the industry. We have – more package sub- packaging suppliers than we've ever had in the past. We have brew house equipment suppliers, actually an oversupply of brew house equipment suppliers. Uh, it's getting corrected a bit, but you know, then you have software companies like us and you know, all of these are designed to make it so that you don't have to rebuild old dairy equipment and uh, you know, beat the street with uh, paper and pencil and map quest directions. That's a, that's a wonderful thing being able to have access to real time point of sale data, for example. That way you can see what's actually happening within your business, be able to use it. Same with your CRM. Uh, you know, these are all designed to make your job and your life that much easier working in this industry. But they are tools that you have to understand how to take advantage of. And, you know, that's a, in the software field, which is what I'm doing these days is, is, is supporting Arrived and the software uh, uh, side, supporting the industry that's one of the cheap things we run into is people will be like, well, I need to do this. And it's a shame y'all can't do that. And it's like, you've been paying for this thing for six years. You didn't know we can do this the entire time. Like people don't even realize what their tools can do. It'd be like uh, having a hammer and you know, that thing can hammer nails in and you, you own that thing for 10 years. And then someone points out to you, it can also pull them out. If you use the other side, uh, it, that that's one of the bigger challenges. Now the resources, the tools, uh, those exist figuring out how to use them best to let you now get back to the beer and people, which are what got you in this industry in the first place, made you passionate about it to begin with. That's what these tools need to be designed to do. And that's what our job should be is to help you use them better so that you can get back to the parts of the business that are uniquely human and are uniquely you. Because exactly. that's what keeps all of us doing this ridiculous, stupid ass industry. And that's, I like you, what you said the beer and the people, because that you're right. That is what it is. That's what it is at the end of the day. And honestly, like uh, it's what kept, I could have easily, I work in other industries. I could have stopped working in alcohol when I went sober, but it's the beer, it's the people in the beer and it's the people that are in the industry and the people that can come into the industry. And that's one of those, those statements that I, I really feel strongly about. And one of, one of the things I think is, um, is for people to understand too, that when we're talking about, you know, suggestions of things to bring into your brewery and things like that, it's not a picking on, if you feel like you're listening to this and you're like, man, they're talking to me. It's actually an opportunity because it's just it's just to realize like the industry is changing and we are in it for a long time. We're not experts by any means, but we've seen a lot of breweries. I've traveled the country many times. So have you. And we've been to a lot of breweries. We've been to a lot of small towns. We've been to a lot of big cities. We've seen every format of the brewery. You know what I mean? Of, of what facet it can be from a garage. I've been in a storage unit before. You know what I mean? Like I've been in a garage, you know, everywhere from that to Miller Coors or whatever, you know. And at the end of the day the the product and the people are the most important things and i think when if we can start looking at things not in a divisive way but like you and i've been talking about as an industry-wide portfolio type thing and say okay maybe let's not even we might even get to a place where i remember in 20 let me say 2017 2018 uh breweries and distilleries and stuff started to call themselves beverage companies Mm -hmm. at the time they were doing it because of the sodas and all that stuff but it's really interesting to see where that went and how that kind of went away. And then where do you kind of, where do you see, I mean, with everything changing and I'm not, if you don't want to answer this, cause it's a prediction question and that's fine. I'll delete it. <laughs> but yeah, like, I'm well known for not having strong opinions. <laughs> let me go, let, let me go back. Actually, let me, let me not even go with prediction. Let me go backwards a little bit. I want to focus on your story and come out of the industry a little bit. I want to talk about your, your story. And you went in, you went in and worked uh, starting at that brewery for and working in the Northeast. And then you went through and you went through some cycles in your own as a manager and an owner of businesses as well. So let's talk a little bit about and I know and I'm going to be with you that I've had businesses that failed. I've lost a lot of money. Things not everything works out. So talk about however, whatever you want to talk about. But let's talk a little bit about 
those, some of those avenues and things that you, you went through and, and opportunities you saw and whether or not they worked, what, what was through that creation process? Yeah. If there's, if there's one thing I hope that I do over the course of my whole life, both inside my career and, and just in general, is to try to be a little bit better tomorrow than I am today and, and just continue that process. Uh, so it's been a, a long history of learning, sometimes the hard way, sometimes the easy way. But I uh, did sales for years, uh, then moved down south. My wife uh, just wanted to live outside New England. She's from Massachusetts. We were living up there at the time. She wanted to live basically anywhere else before we had kids, just to, to have had that experience. And so we moved down to the Charlotte, North Carolina area where we still are. Uh, that, that's a longer story on how we got down here. But uh, from there, kept doing sales, moved into sales and operations, uh, helping run breweries, and then became a consultant. So I was a consultant for six years full time uh, for the industry, consulted with nearly 70 breweries on three continents. Um, got a chance to see and do just about everything there was to do in the industry other than brew beer. My running joke is I've done two commercial batches, which is true. No one wants me doing a third. I don't want me doing a third. I'm a terrible brewer. I don't even homebrew. Uh, but uh, it gave me the opportunity to really see all aspects and more importantly, see how this works at different scales and see how this works in different geographies and see how this works with different operators. And, you know, my original intention was just be a sales and marketing consultant. Uh, but my third ever client had been in business for uh, seven years and they didn't have an accurate P&L. They didn't really have a P&L to speak of. That was when I realized that this industry on the business side, that's what kills breweries. And, and the surveys back this up. Uh, there's been a few surveys done on like the reasons over the last uh, four or five years on why breweries close. It's not bad beer. Like bad beer, it, like good beer now isn't, that's table sticks. That's how you get into the industry. You have to have adequate quality beer to even to even be a sustainable business. What closes breweries is cash flow first and foremost, which is a, a whole nest of, of snakes uh, and lease issues. And, you know, it's, it's, all the, it's all the blocking and tackling, the same things that a business would run into if they were a convenience store or, uh, you know, if they, if they were a hairdresser. You know, they, all this is just running businesses. So was a consultant for six years and was fortunate enough to see failure in many different forms and in hopefully a decent number of cases, be able to help see them through failure and to success. And some of that came with me learning the hard way what does and does not work. Uh, that was hugely informative. After that, I was one of the co-founders on a company called Bavana Partners. If you Google Bavana Partners, there's a whole lot of stories that are going to leave a whole lot of impressions. So I'll... I'll I'll explain what it was, what it technically still is, but I'll explain what it was and I'll explain briefly kind of what happened there. So Bavana Partners, the basic idea was solve some of these problems. As an industry, we were always going to mature. I know there's a lot of agita right now of people who think that the sky is falling and the entire industry is collapsing. That's not what's happening. We're maturing as an industry. There's something called the adoption curve, and I'm going to try and keep this as non-business industry technical as possible. Something called the adoption curve, and with any new technology, it's slow going to start with, and you get people who are really taking risks on new technology. Then you start getting a real uh, acceleration of that growth rate as people start figuring it out. Awareness starts building. People who are excited by new things but aren't necessarily the hyper cutting edge people start picking it up. That's a large group of people. And then as you start getting past that, you get into people who just frankly don't care that that much, they might like it, they might be interested in it, but your growth slows down because now you have to earn their attention in a way that you didn't before. We were always going to see a slowdown on growth and the fact that we had a ton of unsustainable business models because the whole thing was going up, we didn't have to figure out how to, I don't know, run a business, meant that the whole industry was always going to see a level of churn. My personal prediction, I've been very public about this, is that it will plateau, maybe even decline slightly for a few years, and then we will see another smaller, slower period of growth, then it will plateau probably forever. That, that, that will be the more steady state, and that's as far as forward as anybody can predict. Uh, but as this has been happening, one of the things that's become that much more important for any of the breweries that are participating in it now and any of them that are coming is to just learn the basics of running a business and to learn them well. So being able to unlearn some of the lessons like everybody has to have their own brew house. Well, no, you don't. And that's why we have more than 50 percent uh, slack capacity. That's unused brewing capacity in the U.S. right now. Half of what we could be brewing, we're not brewing and we never will. So being able to consolidate some of those resources is absolutely critical. 
you know, multiple tap rooms. Customers care that there's a person behind that beer. That's part of the pitch of our entire uh, our entire category of craft beer as a whole. They don't care if it's brewed on site. <laughs> Time and time again, it's shown they really don't care if it's brewed behind that wall or if it's brewed at a facility across the city or even across the state, as long as you're still able to bring the personality and the human element to that location and deliver an excellent hospitality experience. It's why, among other reasons, it's so important that breweries, uh, tap rooms, differentiate themselves on something other than just if we brew it, they will come. Uh, so Bavana was designed to circumvent uh a lot of that consolidate resources so take breweries that had all the growth prospects and people wanted their beer they're doing amazing things they were just never going to be able to grow under their own power whether due to brewing capacity whether due to cash flow was the chief among them or just not knowing how to do it which is also huge multi-state distribution is hard we'd work with co-packers who have tons of capacity that they can't fill and they don't want to have to deal with 60 small breweries in order to figure out how to fill it um, especially since they know they're probably not getting paid by half of them Work with them, consolidate that capacity, say, hey, we'll fill up all of your tanks. Um, it's going to be across all these different brands, but it will fill up your tanks. Solve your problem. These guys, we're going to get you more brewing capacity. Solve your problem. We're going to sit in the middle, consolidate all the warehousing, solve that cost, and we're going to manage distribution for you. So at one point in time, we had 76 wholesalers, more than 23 brands, 76 wholesalers. That's a, a mini to mini problem from hell, but it, it was something that was solving a real need in the industry. It all came crashing down. There's a lot of reasons for it. And I'll just, to make a really long, complicated, emotional story short, it was so banal, so mundane. It was all just cash flow issues. The same thing that we were designed to fix. And most of it actually predated founding of Bavana, pre, uh, went all the way back to the brewery that we built this on the back of. Uh, so someone's going to pull off that model or at least something that's solving those same exact issues because those problems are still there. So it won't be Bavana, but whatever the case is, whoever does it, we need to find more sustainable ways of saying, hey, we need to be able to combine our resources, whether it's a bunch of breweries coming in under one house, but still operating as separate brands like artisanal brewing ventures. If that is co-packing, but uh, co-packing with eyes wide open and not with some of the predatory practices going both ways that are happening right now, if that is finding ways of doing co-buying or group buying, whether that's shared warehousing or just group negotiation with allied trade providers like me. Uh, we have to find more sustainable ways. And it's not saying that they're not out there. As a matter of fact, other industries have already figured out how to do it. We just have to set aside our own passions and our own egos long enough to say that, yes, the dream of everybody having their own little fiefdom, their own little brew house, their own little tap room, that will still exist in places. That's not going to exist for all of us. And it doesn't mean we're compromising what makes this industry so special. It means we're finding a way to do that and make our businesses successful enough to where we're not having to put 120 hours in every week, pull out what little what little hair that we have and never see our families and not be able to take a paycheck or pay our employees what they deserve because we want to have that. We, we need to get back to beer and people. And that means that some of the things we grew up thinking were essential to beer and people actually weren't because they weren't beer and people. It's stainless steel. I don't care about stainless steel. I care about beer. I care most of all about people. That's the part that I want to see preserved. So after I left Bavana, after all that kind of fell apart, I uh, came on board with Arrived. I've known the folks here for quite a while. Uh, John Kelly, who uh, worked here, is our head of growth up until last week. A uh, good friend brought me into the company and just doing that exact same thing, trying to provide tools and resources that let breweries do a better job so that they can get back to the parts that software can't replace because software can never replace a founder. It can never replace the, the, the concepts, the idea, the brain, the passion, the energy that comes from the people who are actually working in that space. And, and that's why the right tools are so important. And I think that, that one of the things too, when you, two of the things I want to, I appreciate you talking about it. And, and I want to also say that from my own, when I went into in 2017, when I went into this fully on my own, uh, outside of any exclusive contracts, and I started going into building contracts, I went with a similar model of what, what you guys were doing with Bravana. And that's one of the reasons you and I, I think had originally started kind of interacting because we saw each other at conferences. But what I realized quickly as well, and not quickly, like I missed it or anything like that, but I just could never get to any of those projects because it was so capital intensive to float those transactions. And so what I, what I, um, and I tried for years to do it, but 
I could never find enough capital to float all of that back and forth. And, and then it would, it would mean gaps of, of cash flow and things like that. So that, that aside, that, uh, I with you a hundred percent that it it is something that if somebody that is a capital liquid person that can like really take time and wait for money to come back to them, it is a very lucrative opportunity in this industry to do. And I, I fully agree with you. And I think that, yeah, it's just, it comes down to, you have to have a lot of float money and, and that's because sometimes they, people can't pay. And that's, that's where it comes down to at the end of the day. And that's a, the number one thing that uh, I've learned in 20 years of running my own business. I started this business, or almost 20 years, I guess now. I started this business in 2008. And the amount of people that, and this is not a complaint, but I've, I've had more people not pay some, some months than do pay. And then, you know, your revenues get off. And I was always a solopreneur. So there wasn't some capital finance yeah. thing or anything like that. So you know, when I was doing some of these projects, you know, fronting the money and stuff like that. And I actually, I have a funny story that I always tell about TJ Maxx too, when I, uh, we started a pretzel company and we sold seasoned hard pretzels and we did a, a nationwide distribution of the, of Revolu revolution pretzels in 2018 or 2019. I can't huh. remember. And we, but it took us, we didn't, we didn't know, we didn't, we were in the business. It was a business I started. They still exist. They ship coast to coast called the pretzel company.com. Awesome company. Everybody check it out. Fresh baked pretzels shipped same day to your house. But we were at that time a retail operation in York, Pennsylvania, and we got this huge opportunity to be nationwide with a seasoned hard pretzel. But we didn't, we didn't, our broker, whether we weren't listening because we were just excited for the opportunity and the broker didn't explain, I don't know, we were young. We sold, we did it. We filled the tractor trailers and did it, but we didn't realize how long it was going to take to get paid. And this is not a complaint against TJ, TJX or TJ Max. It's just one of those things we just did. I was in my mind, I was coming right out of, uh, I'm in the alcohol world my whole life. So I'm like, dude, it's COD. We're getting paid. I'm thinking myself. <laughs> yeah. And so if absolutely. I can, if I can say anything to anybody listening to this, we've thrown around a couple of terms, and I don't necessarily know like every everybody who's listening in on this, but you know, cash cycle. If you if you're not familiar <laughs> with what your cash cycle is, that's that's basically how long it takes for your outlay of cash to come back to you. And if there is one thing you need to understand, as Especially in the CPG business, it is uh, that's consumer packaged goods, of which alcohol is uh, a type. You need to understand your cash cycle. And the reason you understand your cash cycle, especially in beer, you got to outlay for your raw materials. Now, it's, it's 30, 30 day payment terms uh, if you've earned your way up to them, but you've probably screwed your credit at this point. So you're probably all the way down to COD for your malt. <laughs> uh, one way or the other, you got to outlay for your malt. Uh, and, and let's even uh, say that you're having to buy a lot more than you need for an individual batch. So in practical terms, you're probably outlaying a lot more cash than you're actually putting in. So let's just call that zero day. 22 days, getting an ale uh, all brewed up and then uh, pack, packed off. Now you're ready to ship it. It's going to be like a week before your wholesale is going to be uh, able to get out there, maybe two. Uh, but let's be generous. Uh, add seven days. That's 29 days for your wholesaler to pick it up. Uh, and they're only picking up a quarter of the batch because they want to actually see how it does in the market. Your, your uh, throughput's not that great. You somehow bought a 30-barrel system because you thought you were going to be in the next freaking Sierra Nevada, and turns out you're not. So they're uh, over the course of, let's call it – 150 days, they might pick up the entirety of that uh, that 30 barrel batch, uh, and you got 30 day terms with them as well. So every time they pick up, they got 30 days to pay you. And depending on your relationship with them, it might be 45 or 60 because they know you're not going anywhere because franchise laws. So chances are good you're not actually getting your money, even if they picked up the entire batch for, you know, let's say. 60 days plus from the time that you actually outlaid for your raw materials. So Even you might, if, your number there, you're five to six months from the time you took that money out. To actually get it all back, um, that's the cash cycle. Now, the, you you fix that by having a float, that your float is basically your protection against cash cycle shocks. That's the money that you're actually keeping in your bank account, but cash is expensive. That's money you're not investing back in your business, not investing towards growth. So it's hard is really what I'm drilling into. Uh, and more companies are sunk by they think they're doing everything right, but they wind up putting the money in the wrong place. It doesn't come back quick enough. And before you know it, they, even if the underlying business looks good, they're out of cash. 
And that's a massive, massive, massive problem because cash is not easy to come by. And back in the day, people were throwing cash at craft breweries like crazy. They were getting money. They didn't even need money. They really shouldn't have gotten. That doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. There's some, so there's some questionable subprime mortgage uh, deals. <laughs> oh, yeah. So unless you're going after your friends and family, you're in a tough position. Plus, you got a personal guarantee on your business because you're a small business through the SBA. So your home's at risk now. Um, most uh, owners don't know enough about bankruptcy law to even realize Chapter 11 might be on the table as an alternative form just to keep themselves sustainable. They see bankruptcy and they think freaking monopoly. So all these things go into, you know, these aren't all sophisticated operators. I don't mean that as an insult because that's how it comes across. What I mean is these are people who were engineers or lawyers or IT people or, or you know, ran a construction, but any number of things, what they didn't run was a brewery. Not a ton of brewery, and, and a lot of the people who did work in the brewing industry who go on to run breweries were brewers who also didn't have to deal with a lot of the stuff every day, uh, at least in a, in, a, in a decent number of breweries that are uh, operator-owned. So it creates this environment where cash sinks businesses because they don't even realize what the problem is until they get there. Uh, and before you know it, there's just not literally enough money to fix it. I've seen breweries go out of business because they were growing too fast and they didn't have enough uh, money to plow back into that growth because to, in the it wasn't coming back. In the distributor world, we, when we sat down with people in the boardroom and we went through their cost of goods, we would have to go through their cost of goods and help them make sure their margins were set. I know that I was an anomaly. I know that not every brand manager did that. That's assuming they know how to, they know what their cost of goods are because that also happens all the time. But it was that. And, and we had a phrase where it was, we warned people sell so much, you go out of business. Mm -hmm. And, and it was, and, and I want to bring back to, there's a point you said too, where it was, uh, where people fearing technology. And I want to tie this back to like what you do currently and the, and the, and the mission as well as the, as the value. And I, I don't need, I'll say what it is because from my perspective, the value of technology with a company like Arrived or any other equivalent of that, but you being, you being the one that I'm driving on for this conversation, if anybody is in the business of CPG and does not currently have a technology and isn't reaching out to people like Arrived to talk to them about their business, it is not a replacement of you. It is not, and that's what I want. I want to drive home this part. And the next thing is it actually, when we talk about beer and people, and that is the driving factor. If you have an efficient system that's backing you up with when it comes to technology, you have more time to be with those consumers at your brew pub or at home with your family, whatever those two priorities of your life is. But that's your only two priorities. When you run a brewery, oh, nice, good balloons there. Yeah. <laughs> so when you run a when you run a brewery, your priority is your customer and your family. You know, obviously your employees are all a part of it, and they're all they're all a piece of that. But that's really what it comes down to: your time. You're like, my time's to make a consumer experience good, whether it's off the shelf at some retailer that's carrying my stuff or it's in my tap room. My job is to make sure the consumer has a good experience and my, I want to make sure my home life is in check. And I think that people don't realize that technology is an efficiency that gives you back your time, which is more valuable than any of the cash we've talked about as well. 100 percent. People don't scale. And I, I've said that to people time and time again, uh, going all the way back to when I first started consulting. Pete, you don't scale. You know, and you, you don't have the ability to hire the people to, to do a lot of these jobs for you. There's going to be things that a piece of technology cannot do for you that still need done. You only have so many hours of the day, even if you're absolutely killing yourself to do it, even if you are mortgaging your family life in order to do it. There's only one of you and you will eventually burn out even if you're able to keep up with it. And you probably won't. So having the right tools, the right technology, whatever that is. The entire purpose is to get you back to the elements of this business that you either specialize in or that need done that there's not a replacement for you on. That's the goal. That's the point. And you're 100% right. The number of people I know who are still doing all of their inventory management and uh, sales uh, on spreadsheets would just absolutely blow your mind. And and I understand that some of the options that were out there were prohibitively expensive. But now you have very um, – library management, I can get it down to $99 a month. And there's other options that are also affordable even for very small breweries. Like that we're in a different time than we were before where it was you know, 750 800 bucks a month and that was the only thing. I get why you stuck with spreadsheets. You will save yourself far, far more than, let's just say, $99 of time in a given month just by getting you focusing on your customers, on sales forecasting, on your team, on just keeping yourself upright so that you don't 
the bottom doesn't fall out of you and your spirit. And if you and your think morale. about it, like as a business owner, and, and you've been you've been one. We're all we're all different you know, things in different aspects yeah. of things. We value our time, different things. But mm-hmm. let's say as a business owner, you should value. I've always told business owners, regardless of your revenue, you should value your hour as two hundred and fifty dollars as a small business owner. And people always say to me, "Well, why?" I'm like, "I'm not tra- talking about charging it. I'm talking about when you want to decide on a product like this. When yeah. you want to decide on a product mm-hmm. like this." If that product can save you one hour per month and your time is worth $250 a month, that product just made you money. <laughs> and unless you got a cash concern, which again is, is a huge problem, that that's the only counter argument. And in those cases, so many of the other places you could be spending that hour are going to be things that are making you money. Or well, at even, least even though, you make, like you said, saving like you it, money. Yeah. And like you said, too, when you really break it down and I hate doing like napkin math for people, but. What is that to what is that to somebody? An extra five to ten cases? If you if that sells you five to ten more cases a month, then it pays for itself and then some too. Yeah. And, and you can and look I, depending on how you look at a value, you know what I mean? Like either way. And and this industry, it's hard. It's a whole lot of people who are doing things they weren't trained on. Yep. And there's a whole there's an enormous lack of of real institutional industry knowledge on a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I tell people all the time, you go to any brewers conference, there's gonna be an entire track dedicated to technical brewing. You know what we have enormous amount of resources on that are readily accessible and pretty easy to get your hands on? Technical brewing. You know it doesn't c- kill breweries? Technical brewing. It's important, critical. But those resources, that we, we've, that's well-trod ground. If you want to make good beer, the resources are out there. And it, there's improvements being made. There's, uh, there's innovations being made. But if the benchmark is make good beer, that's the, we know how to do that as an industry. We don't know how to run sustainable businesses. And we don't have that same corpus of knowledge and, and know how to find it, know how to access it, know how to apply it in that same way. And it, it's an interesting industry because the things that have to go into running these businesses are not the same things that got them into it to begin with. And it's probably the areas they're the least comfortable with. So being able to, to explain to people that, you know, I know that you have a reticence towards diving into this because you have the classic mechanic problem. I'm telling you what's wrong, but you don't know enough about it to even know if I'm just gaslighting you about what is wrong and how to fix it. That's a problem. But what we have to do is be a little more open to investing in our own businesses because as the industry slows down, I've seen a lot of people start to turtle up. They're, they're not spending on things to help their business. They just want to not spend anything, not do anything. Let's just sustain and not assume any risk. Those are going to be the ones that die over the next couple of years. You have to reinvest in your business. You have to go start grabbing on to some of these uh, things that are going to let you get back to doing the things that are generating value for your business. You have to continue to drive value for your customers. And just continuing to do what you've always done because it got you here is not necessarily going to get you through these next few years because things are changing. You're not running a brewery tapper. You are running a bar and or restaurant. It's called a brewery tap room. It's appended to a brewery. It is competing with bars and restaurants, and now it has to operate like a bar and a restaurant. You are running a logistics company, a distribution company. You're running a manufacturer. That is really what your brew house is, as a manufacturing facility. You are running a marketing firm in-house to actually promote your products. I get it. It's a lot of hats. Find tools, find people, find resources that can help you do it right so that you can get back to the vision, you can get back to the direction that uh, that you can't replace. I'll never be able to tell you what beer to make. I can tell you what your beers are selling best. I can tell you what's going to be the most profitable for you. I can tell you some of the insights on uh, you know, what it's suggesting is going to sell well with your same customer set. I can't tell you what makes your company you. I can't, I can't give you a mission statement. That has to come from here. And that's what brands are built out of. That's what differentiation is built out of. And that's what success is built out of. I want to I want to close this out and I could talk to you for days. I mean, I know we could talk for days. <laughs> and that's, a, that's well, a, part two coming eventually. I don't exactly. Know. <laughs> exactly. But I, I want to close. I want to close with this. I want everybody to understand that, like, this is not a sales pitch by any means. And this conversation is is intentional in the evolution. And I wanted it to start out in the way we talked about our analog startings in the business. And I want to get to the tech side of things, because like you said, I'm just reiterating a couple of things and highlighting here is that you can't. It's not a matter of an ego. It's not a matter of we're challenging you. You cannot operate effectively in 2024 on on Excel files. And and we're not telling you from some basement somewhere. We're telling you from businesses we've seen go through this anecdotally in our experience. And the majority of it is such a majority that it's a cautionary tale. 
And and that's where that's what I want to try to drive home as well as making people understand that technology is tech. While we get scared about AI is going to take everything over, AI is going to cause our businesses. I've seen I've said this a thousand times on this and my partner on uh, Johnny and I, we talk about this a lot because we use AI on the back end of our production. Our conversations are all authentic. Our conversations are raw, authentic, single shoot on the back end. I don't spend 12 hours editing. That's not a good use of my time because we're in 2024 and technology is advanced. I'm not saying that as a mocking of somebody. I'm saying that as letting people understand that you can be both. You can be authentic and you can utilize technology. And that's something we do. It's something you do in your life. And I want people to reach out to you specifically. You can redirect them in other ways. But checking out Arrived, making people understand that it's a very simple way to get in. You can get a demo with you. You can kind of go through and not necessarily, maybe not with you specifically, but other people in the business. I want everybody to get out there, reach out if they haven't yet and talk to Aaron on LinkedIn, as well as reach out to Arrived if you're a brewery, any sort of manufacturer that's in their wheelhouse and just have the conversation. That's all. I'm, I'm going to challenge everybody. I'm not telling you to sign up, but I'm challenging everybody to hop on, get a demo, ask the questions, walk through your daily life with them and let them show you how the how it can help you. There you go. There's no commitment. They don't take any money for the demos. They just want you to learn the system. So, yeah. And I t- tell people all the time, I would rather you find the right solution for you, not just our solution. So, so shop around, figure out what makes the most sense for you. But uh, still, he's 100 percent right. Um figure out what tools are available, figure out what tools make the most sense for your business, both in the software side, just in general, you know, you do the same thing in your brew house. I know a lot of breweries, they, they do, they explore around and figure out what's going to make the most sense back there. You owe it to every part of your business. Taproom's uh, the number one profit driver for 84% of breweries in the U S. So almost everybody listening to this, that's number one profit driver for your entire company. So you can't afford to get it wrong. So, you know, reach on out. My name's Aaron Gore, A-A-R-O-N dot G-O-R-E at dot com. Hit me up. You know, I would love to be able to show you a little what we got going on. But even if we're not the right solution for you, I just want you to take this seriously. Figure out what is, you know, I've been around this industry a very long time. Done almost everything. I work with 36 state trade organizations. I'm on committees for six of them, run two other independent events. I run three nonprofits around the industry. I'm on the board of directors for the American Craft Beer Hall of Fame. Like I live and breathe this stuff. And I am begging you as somebody who wants to see this industry continue to thrive, not just survive into the future. We've got two small girls who I'd love to have their pick of IPAs when they reach the age of, you know, we'll we'll say 21 for legal reasons. Uh, Please take advantage of the tools that are out there, figure out what ones work best for your business and start taking this seriously as a business, not just a hobby. I've always been a little pissed off at Julie Rhodes for coining Not Your Hobby Marketing. Um, I thought that was the most brilliant name because we do. We got to start taking this seriously because it is serious and and, and you know it too. Uh, you know, you've got your family, you've got your, your employees, you've got your local uh, community that are relying on you and, you know, the help is out there. You just got to take it. And there's nothing wrong with taking it because that's the best opportunity that you have to be as successful as we'd all like to see you be. Well, Aaron, I appreciate you taking the time today. And in closing, I also want to say, like, as people are getting hit up a lot with these technology companies, everybody's probably saying, yeah, I got a thousand of them in my email. I want to tell tell everybody one thing. There are a million technology companies out there, but there are not many that are geared and have experience in the industry. And so with that, in closing, I really appreciate it, Aaron. And I want to recommend everybody like checking out people like Arrive, checking out people like Aaron, if you're looking in the tech world, people that have experience and can tell you those anecdotal stories where they saw people go wrong, not because they watched a course or not because they learned and in the call center and went through the thing, like literally partnering (laughs) with people like Arrived and people like Aaron who have seen it and can help you and grow. But Aaron, thank you again so much, everybody. Check Aaron out on LinkedIn, check out Arrived. And dude, I'm so excited we finally got together and did this. And thank you, man. I'm looking forward to many more. I appreciate you, Nate. Thank you so much. And just to follow up, one last thing. If they've never passed out on the grain bags in the brew house, then they're not qualified to tell you what your business needs. So talk to everybody, but that should be your benchmark because I have definitely done that before. That is a good criteria. There's your, there's your <laughs> discovery question. If they can't answer that question, call Aaron. <laughs> hey, cheers, hey, take, guys. Take care, buddy. If you have a great story or know someone that does, check out our website at thefreemindpodcast.com and submit your story today or nominate a friend. Thanks. Have a great day, everybody. Keep listening. You know my story, right? Rise the fame from the pain to glory, right?